Philippians chapter number two. And as you're turning there, I trust that you know, but I'm not going to take anything for granted. So let me just tell you this morning that God's word is absolutely and abundantly clear that salvation is not the end of the Christian life. Salvation is the beginning of the Christian life. Uh, I want us to understand when it comes to this idea of salvation. Uh, according to what the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Timothy, God's desire is that all men everywhere would be saved. I want you to understand that, that God wants all men to be saved, but God's desire and God's design was not that you would come to the knowledge of Jesus. The, God's desire was not that you would be saved and then never do anything with it. You see, God wants all men to be saved, but God wants all saved men to become like Jesus. You see, salvation has never been the end of the Christian life. It has been the very beginning. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. A birth is not the end of a life. A birth is the beginning. And so what, uh, what Paul has been talking about, and what I'm giving you right now is a little bit of context before we get into the text that we're going to read today. The Apostle Paul has been talking about the Christian Life. He's been talking about God's desire for us as saved people. One of the examples that, that Paul gives uh, for us following God's will and God's desire is the example of Jesus. In context, beginning at the beginning uh, of chapter number 2, he tells us about Jesus and what it was that Jesus did and how Jesus was humble and how Jesus took upon uh, himself the, the form of a serpent, uh, not a serpent, a servant. I'm just making sure you're listening. <laughs> Jesus took upon himself the form of a servant uh, uh, and that he was obedient to the Father even to the death of the cross. Uh, what Paul is doing and the reason that Paul gave us that example, you might remember that Paul said, wherefore? In verse 12, Paul said, because of the example of Jesus, you and I ought to take our salvation and work it out. Again, we're not talking about working in order to get our salvation in. We're talking about living a Christian life, taking our salvation and doing something with it. Now listen, before you came in here today, you already knew that. Some of you are saying, preacher, you haven't taught us or told us anything yet. Here's what I want to acknowledge today. There is a tendency inside the human heart. When we are told that, that, uh, uh, that as a saved person, that we are to live a sanctified life, that as a saved person, we ought to try to be like Jesus. There's a voice inside of us that says, well, that's not really fair. Because Jesus was perfect, and I'm not. And I think many times that becomes our excuse. Well, I would try to become like Jesus, but I never will. So there's no sense in me even trying. And if you just kind of uh, keep the text that we are about to read in context. Paul has just told us about the great example of Jesus. He's just told us to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And I believe what Paul does now is Paul gives us two everyday regular guy examples of Christians who are living out the Christian life in the way that God designed for them. And in our text this morning, what Paul gives us is two Christian examples that are absolutely worth examining. In order that we may reverence the Word of God and the God of the Word, would you stand with me? I hope and I pray that this will make a little more sense to you now. Look with me, if you would, beginning at verse number 19. God's Word says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. But you know the proof of him that as a son with the Father, he hath served with me in the gospel. Him, therefore, I hope to send presently so soon as I shall see how it will go with me. But I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. 
I sent him therefore the more carefully that when you see him again, you may rejoice and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service to me. Father, we come before you this morning. Lord, we know and we acknowledge and we, we recognize and we admit, Father, that once we have been saved, your desire is that we would live for you. Father, that we would be surrendered to you and that day by day we would become more and more like Jesus Christ. But Father, sometimes uh, we forget that and sometimes we become overwhelmed in that quest and in that desire. And so God, we are so thankful for your word that shares with us too, just everyday ordinary guys who are living the Christian life in the way that you would have us to live. Father, as we examine their example, Father, let us be motivated, let us be educated and let us see the truths that are in your word and see where we can apply them to our lives. Father, I pray most of all that you receive all of the honor and the glory from this message this morning. And these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Let me remind you very quickly this morning before we get into it, kind of looking uh, specifically and examining these examples. Let me remind you, uh, remind you that the Apostle Paul was in Rome in a Roman prison uh, when he wrote this particular letter. Uh, a lot of accounts tell us that, that even though Paul was a prisoner, Paul was thinking about the welfare of these Philippian believers. And Paul wanted them to know how to live the Christian life. Paul uh, 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 wanted them to understand understand what it was that God wanted from them. And so what Paul said is he said, I'm going to send these two fellows to you. Now, I don't think he said the word fellows, but you know what I mean. Paul said, I I'm going to send Timothy to you, but I got to wait and see how things shake out with me. So I'm going to send Timothy shortly, but I'm sending Epaphroditus to you uh, uh, immediately. It's believed by most that Epaphroditus was the one that actually carried the letter, the, uh, the, the book of Philippians. Part of the, many believe uh, he carried that letter back to the church. But what's interesting is the way in which Paul chooses to describe these two men. Uh, I believe that in describing these two men, Paul shows us and Paul shares with us examples of the right way for you and I to live the Christian life. So I want to invite you this morning, let's examine these examples and see what it is that God's Word tells us about how to flesh out our salvation. I want you to look with me number one this morning. I'm not going to make this real complicated. I'm going to try to make this real easy because again, God's word is not given just for information. God's word is given for application. Amen. Amen. So let's keep this real simple. Notice with me number one, the example of Timothy. The example of Timothy, some have described Timothy as Paul's son in the faith. You know why Timothy has been described as Paul's son in the faith? Because on more than one occasion, Paul says, Timothy, my son in the faith. You thought it was going to be something more impressive than that, didn't you? <laughs> but Paul, as he begins to describe Timothy here, he says there in verse number 19, that I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you. And then Paul begins to describe Timothy a little bit. And I've chosen three words to try to summarize what Paul was saying. And I want you to, to follow along with, these, uh, with me this morning and understand that when Paul described Timothy, Paul said that Timothy, number one, was a sincere man. Look, if you would, there, verse number 20, Paul says, for I have no man like mine. And then here is the key to this, uh, this entire little verse here, who will naturally that word naturally that's used in the Greek language there is probably the most uh, equivalent to our current English word as genuinely. Paul says, I want to send Timothy to you because he uh, is genuine. Genuine in what? We'll read the scripture. Who will genuinely care for your state. He will generally care about your welfare. Now listen, I, I would love to tell you that anytime you enter inside the, the ranks or into the realms of church folk, that every word that's ever said was a genuine word. Wouldn't that be nice? But let's just be honest. Not every Christian generally uh, or genuinely cares for your welfare. I didn't figure you'd shout me down and maybe some of you say, oh, is he talking to me? Listen, here's what I know. Timothy, Paul said, was a man that actually cared 
whether the believers in Philippi were growing in Christ, actually cared whether they were joyful in Christ, actually cared whether they were following Christ. Some of some you say, well, preacher, what do you mean actually cared? I thought everybody actually cared. Listen, one of these days, uh, uh, just pay attention even inside a church house. Now listen, I'm not shaming anybody. I'm just making a generalized observation. The old, the old uh, adage probably holds true that if the shoe fits, wear it, right? Some say, preacher, you're about to step on my toes. If I am, move your feet, amen? You ever paid attention on any given Sunday? And people say, hey, brother, hey, sister, how are you? That sounds like a genuine question. But oh, you, you ever notice some... Uh, some not quite so genuine responses after that. People begin to say, well, I'm really not doing all the well. This and this and this and this. And people go, oh, I just wanted you to say good and I'm done. I didn't genuinely care for your welfare. I just kind of went through the motions. What Paul is saying about Timothy was Timothy was not a man going through the motions of brotherly love. Timothy was not a man uh, uh, who took the scriptures and took the, 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 uh, the, the, the thought processes and, and the principles of Jesus to love one another. Timothy didn't take those things lightly. He seriously and genuinely was interested uh, in the welfare of others. Timothy was not interested in seeking a personal benefit. Do you remember, I, I believe it was in the New Testament, it's the book, uh, the book of James, if I'm not mistaken, towards the latter part of that book, James says that pure religion and undefiled before God is to visit the widows and the fatherless. You ever wondered why that was such a great example of pure religion and undefiled? Because widows and orphans had nothing to give you back in return. But James said, if you want to know what a sincere Christian looks like, it's one that doesn't say, I want to be friends with you because you've got something that'll benefit me. I'm going to call old brother so-and-so, uh, make sure that he's doing good after his surgery because I need to borrow his lawnmower next week. You, you know what I'm saying? This was a, uh, Paul said, Timothy was one who genuinely cared. Paul and Timothy spent a lot of time together. Uh, and we gather that they probably conversed. I don't know from what, you, you understand that Timothy was with Paul when he went to Philippi the first time. I don't know from what they sat down and said, you know, I wonder how old so-and-so is doing. You know, he's got the, the bum leg and, and I wonder how, how well I, I don't know the specifics, but the principle is simply this. Timothy was a man that was sincere. He really cared about other people, specifically those in the church at Philippi. So here's the question I ask of you this morning. How genuine is your interest in the welfare of others? Uh, are you genuinely interested in your brothers and sisters in Christ or are you only interested in what they can do for you? You see, a real true follower of Christ, a real true servant of God will be sincere in their care for others. Friends, I want to encourage you. Care for one another. Love one another. Bear one another's burdens. Prefer one another but not as a ruse and not as a show. Sincerely. Amen? I want you to notice the second way. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on any of these this morning, but I want you to notice the second way that, that when Paul described Timothy as he was living out his Christian life, he said, Timothy was a man who naturally cared for your sin. He was a sincere man. But notice with me in verse number 21, Timothy was a selfless man. Paul makes a statement here that's very interesting. Paul says, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. You know, I spent a lot of time this week studying out that one little verse, trying to figure out what is the specific that Paul was talking about. I don't think for one second that Paul was saying that there is no other human being on the face of the earth uh, uh, that is uh, uh, serving Jesus Christ. I don't think he was kind of like Elijah when he said, it's me and only me. I'm the only one left, God. I don't think that's what Paul was referring to here. But I think that Paul was stating that there were quite a few people who when called upon and when it came time to do a service for the Lord, chose rather to do a service for self. Now again, this is a little bit of speculation. 
But some have argued that maybe what Paul was saying, remember he just said, I, I, I plan to send Timothy to you eventually. And perhaps some think that maybe Paul had asked many others, can you go to Philippi? Can you go check on those believers? They are just overwhelmed with grief because of where I am. Can you go there? And what you need to understand is that travel in Paul's day was not as luxurious as travel is today. Travel was very strenuous. Travel was, uh, was very hard. It was very dangerous. And so so there's a possibility that Paul had asked many others, would you go and would you visit? Would you encourage this church at Philippi? Would you stay with them and help them grow in their walk with the Lord? And it's presumed that maybe many of those said, no, 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 no. I don't want to go do the work of the Lord because that doesn't really fit in my plans. You see, at some point in time, what we need to understand about our walk with the Lord, Jesus made it very plain that your Christian walk must include some self-denial. Paul said Timothy was a man who put the interest of Jesus Christ above his own. Let me try to make this just as plain and simple. And understand, I'm not taking anybody to the woodshed. Uh, I'm not here this morning to, uh, to, to make you feel like you've been to the principal's office. Uh, I'm just here to show you some principles from the Word of God. But I want you to understand this truth. The Christian life has never been about doing what I want to do. The Christian life is about doing what Jesus wants me to do. It was Jesus himself that said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Friends, Albert Barnes, Bible commentator of a long time ago, speaking of the Christian life, said that every Christian must be willing to sacrifice their own things, to deny themselves of ease, and to be always ready to expose themselves to peril and want if they may be the means of advancing Christ's cause. You see, when Paul described Timothy, he said, listen, there's a lot of people that say, no, I can't go do what you need me to do. I can't do Jesus' work. Because it just doesn't really fit into my schedule. But old Timothy was a selfless man. He was a man that said, I'm going to put the interest of Jesus above the interest of my own. Friends, I want to ask a, a question, a rhetorical question. For those of you that do not know what a rhetorical question is, that means don't answer out loud. Amen. But friends, if your life would look any different, let me ask you something. Would your life look any different? If you put the interests of Jesus above the interests, uh, the interest of your own. If you say, yeah, my life would look a lot different if I would put Jesus first and, uh, instead of myself first. Friends, if that is the case, can I just encourage you? Be a selfless man. Put the interest of Jesus above your own. Is it easy? No. Is it worth it? Every time. Notice Timothy was not only a sincere man and a selfless man. But Timothy was what I'll call a seasoned man. Seasoned uh, in the sense of, look what he says in verse number 22, but you know the proof of him. He was seasoned as in he had already had a chance to prove himself. Timothy was with Paul when he was there in Philippi. And even though we're not given a whole lot of the specific details... Paul was making the statement, he says, but you, church at Philippi, you already know Timothy. Yes, he's going to be a familiar face when I send him to you. But he's not just a familiar face. He is also a proven or a seasoned face. Paul is essentially saying, you've already seen with your own eyes the evidence of how Timothy faithfully devoted himself. Look what it says in verse 22, and hath served with me in the gospel. He said, you've already seen him. You've already seen, uh, had a chance uh, for him to, to see the proof of his work in the gospel. Now listen, when the Bible tells me that, that you've seen the proof, it tells me that there was opportunities for Timothy to either continue serving the Lord or to choose not to. There was opportunities for Timothy to be faithful or not to be faithful in the work of the gospel. And Timothy chose to be faithful. I, I want you to think about this. Timothy was not saved and was immediately seasoned. It doesn't work that way. 
When Timothy was saved, he was just like you and me. Uh, uh, Timothy uh, uh, wasn't just saved and automatically figured out this whole living the Christian life thing without any hiccups. No, you see what happened when Timothy saved, he was like any, any others. He was a baby. He was a novice. He was a rookie. Choose whichever word you want to choose. But here's what I believe Timothy did in order to, uh, so that they would see the proof of him. Timothy stuck it out. Timothy, when faced with troubles and trials or even just, the, the, uh, just time, Timothy stuck it out. He proved that he would be faithful in the ministry. And I want you to think about this. Timothy grew into a life of faith and into a life of holiness. It didn't just happen. He stuck it out. And Paul says, you've seen the proof of him. Some of you don't look like you're quite with me on, on understanding this concept of being seasoned. So I heard one preacher years ago uh, that described this concept this way. I realize that it is now August and uh, it's not quite Christmas time, but I want you to think about Christmas morning. Uh, if you can, now some of you may have to go back a couple days, but imagine Christmas morning, not more recently, but maybe when you were a kid. Uh, you remember Christmas morning, you'd wake up and there were packages and uh, if, if you were blessed, there were packages plural but you remember there was always that little package from grandma you, you know which one i'm talking about and before you even opened it up you knew exactly what it was it was always a sweater from grandma you remember that oh listen some of you some of you uh, don't know if you remember that far back and some of you maybe this never happened but listen grandma always had clothes and i remember getting clothes from grandma and i would open that package and i would look at it and it would be about four sizes too big you know what i'm saying uh and you, you'd put that on and they'd always like dad would always want to take a picture of you so you could send it to grandma and you'd put this old sweater on and the sleeves came down to here and it stood out about this wide and went down to about your knees and you look like a hockey jersey sitting on you and grandma would look at that or look at a picture and you know what grandma would always say that looks great it's a little big now but you'll grow into it friends can I tell you that I think sometimes when we're saved we try this whole Christian life thing out we try a life of purity we try a life of holiness we try a life of, uh, of sanctification we try a life of following the Lord but it just doesn't seem to fit very well the sleeves of holiness come down to here and the, the sides of purity are out to here uh, uh, and this idea of a sanctified life it looks like a dress on us and we look at ourselves in the mirror and we say this doesn't look right this doesn't feel right it just doesn't seem to be working and I can only imagine that Timothy was in that same boat but here's what Timothy did. Timothy continued. Timothy didn't quit. Timothy kept serving with Paul in the gospel. And eventually, you know what happened to Timothy? He grew into the Christian life. What I want to encourage you this morning is to be a seasoned man. Listen, uh, sanctification, following Christ may fit too big for you right now. But don't take it off and throw it in the closet. Keep growing. Keep feeding. Keep Keep eating from the Word of God. Don't quit. Grow into it. Become a seasoned, proven man. Amen? Paul said, listen, here's what the Christian life is all about. It's about a life of sincerity. It's about a life of selflessness. It's about a life of being seasoned and being proven. And I'm telling you, friends, that this is just the tip of the iceberg. If you ever wanted to just study or examine the example of Timothy. But man, what an example it is. But I want to, for the sake of time this morning, I want to move on. Because Paul gives us two examples. He tells us, yes, about Timothy and what a great example Timothy is. But Paul, secondly, gives us the example of Epaphroditus. Uh, if you look with me at verse 28, Paul says, I sent him therefore the more carefully that when you see him again, you may rejoice that I may be the less sorrowful. Listen to what he says. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation. In all likelihood, Paul is sending Epaphroditus back to Philippi, probably carrying this letter that he has written. And Paul is writing to the church at Philippi. He's encouraging them. He says, receive Epaphroditus. Hold him in high regard. Well, now, why in the world would Paul tell them to receive him and hold him in high regard? Well, it's based on the description that Paul gives us another example that is worth examining. When you look at this person, now, this example of Epaphroditus, go back to verse 25. And what I want you to see is that Epaphroditus was a serving man. 
Look at the way that Paul describes Epaphroditus, verse 25. He says, Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, my companion in labor, my fellow soldier. Catch this part. But your messenger. How was Epaphroditus serving as their messenger? How was he the messenger of the church at Philippi there? Well, listen, some of you may be Bible scholars. Some of you, uh, uh, if, if you really need to know, you can just look ahead at chapter 4, verse number 18. Here's what happened. When Paul was put in prison, the church at Philippi took up an offering. And they wanted to send this offering to help the apostle Paul. And they sent this offering by the hand of a man named Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus was the one that carried the love offering from the church to the apostle Paul. Now, some of you say, preacher, what difference does that make in all of the world? Well, number one, it is proof that Epaphroditus was serving as the church's messenger. But can I tell you that I believe it also speaks a little bit about the type of person that Epaphroditus was? You see, I, I want you to understand, I, we already mentioned travel was not easy. Travel was dangerous. Uh, and so uh, there's a couple things. Number one, it tells us that Epaphroditus was probably a brave man. It took courage to travel anywhere. It took courage to be associated with a prisoner in Rome. And Epaphroditus was proven to be a brave man. He said, I'll take the offering from Philippi to Paul. But I also think that it proves the point that Epaphroditus was a trustworthy person. I want you to think about that for a moment. Church took up a large love offering. They didn't send Epaphroditus with a debit card. You know that, right? They didn't send him with a cashier's check. They probably sent him with a bunch of cash. And friends, no church in their right mind is going to send someone with cash halfway across the known world uh, unless that person was a trustworthy person. Epaphroditus was a serving person. He served as the church's messenger. But notice what Paul says, and he that, in, uh, that verse 25, and he that ministered to my wants. He served as their messenger, but he served as Paul's minister. Did you catch the words that Paul used to describe this particular man? He says, my brother. He says, my companion. And he says, my fellow soldier. Oh, much could be said about those words. And uh, what I'm about to tell you is not all that could be said about those words. But I just want to make this one little point this morning in reference to the fact that Epaphroditus was a serving man. Paul never said Epaphroditus was a, 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 a good onlooker. He never said Epaphroditus did a really good job at sitting on a pew and making sure it didn't float in the air. He never said that Epaphroditus did a really good job of just sitting there looking pretty. No, he said, Epaphroditus was my brother. He was my companion. He was my fellow soldier. You know what those words tell me? Epaphroditus was a man who worked for the Lord. He did not sit on the sideline and watch Paul work, but he got in, he got his hands dirty, and he labored together for the work of the Lord. Friends, what does that have to do with you and me today? Well, let me make the, what I believe to be an obvious point even more obvious. God's desire for you is not just to sit on the sideline. God's desire for you is to serve Him. To serve Him with gladness. To serve Him with a sincere heart. God's desire is that you would be a servant of Him. Notice secondly that Paul describes Epaphroditus not only as a serving man, but he de describes him as a sensitive man. Look what he says in verse 26. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness. Why? Because that ye had heard that he had been sick. God's word tells us that at some point in time, hopefully you caught it when we read in the text, but at some point in time, whether it was during the journey or whether it was during Epaphroditus' time there in Rome, at some point in time, the Bible says he became sick. Now, uh, listen, this wasn't just a little man cold. This was a sick where he was literally near death. I want you to think about this. Listen, I'll just be honest with you. I'll be transparent just a little bit with you this morning. I don't have a lot of time to, to, to go off here, but I would like to think uh, I strive to, to, to try to be selfless. Now, listen, I've got work and room that I need to work. But I try to think of others. I try to help others. I try to sacrifice myself. And, and I try to go and, uh, and, and be thinking of others. And to be praying for others. And to encourage others. And I don't do all that bad until I get sick. My wife didn't say it out loud. But she's nodding her head. Amen. I know she is. 
I can't speak for any of you, but you know what happens to me when I get sick? The whole world stops. I'm telling you, when I get sick, my focus becomes so inside. I mean, listen, I don't get sick very often. And when I do, I feel like I make up for lost time. But I'm telling you, man, when I get sick, oh, I just want to lay that. And all I seem to think about is me and how bad I feel and all of these other things. But notice Epaphroditus, when he was sick, did you notice what he was doing? He was worried about the other people that were worried about him for being sick. Listen, I've had a couple church members like that. In the time that I've pastored, I've gone to people when I knew that they were not far from death and I've visited them in their home and uh, I've met, I said, man, I just, I'm here to check on you and, uh, and I want to just pray with you. And the first words out of the mouth is, well, how, how are you? How's your family? How's old so-and-so at the church? It wasn't that long ago that I met with a young lady in an emergency room. It wasn't far from the, the day that she went home to be with the Lord. And she was just as sick as a dog. And I remember sitting there in the emergency room. Sister Sharon went, many of you know her. And Sister Sharon went, never even really let me ask a question about how she was. Brother Arnie knows he was sitting there. It was just constant. Well, how's so-and-so? Well, how's so-and-so? Are these person doing okay? Has this person got to feeling better yet? And it was the same idea of being sensitive. Epaphroditus was the one who was sick and nearly died yet he was concerned about the welfare of others friends Paul said already in this chapter if you go back to verse 3 Paul said let nothing be done through strife or vain glory but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves look not every man on his own things but every man on the things of others and just in case our tendency was to say well Jesus could do that but no human could Paul said no let me tell you about Epaphroditus there's a good chance that, oh, by the way, Epaphroditus carrying some money probably didn't travel alone. That would have been foolish. So there's a good chance that there was a whole group from the church at Philippi that went with Epaphroditus. They probably knew that he was sick, and they probably went back to the church and said, man, we don't know what's going to happen with Epaphroditus. Uh, we think that he's near death. And so here this was this man sick as a dog, and all he wanted to do is say, man, I just hope those other people know that, that I'm going to be all right. Oh, by the way, Paul includes this in here, and I just want to throw this in here. Verse 27, Paul says, God had mercy on him. Epaphroditus did not die. God was merciful to him. But when you look at this person of Epaphroditus, he was a serving man. He was a sensitive man, but notice he was also a sacrificial man. Verse 30, because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life, to just sum it all up in a few phrases. Epaphroditus was willing to put his own life on the line in order that the work of Christ may be done. Friends, as I was sitting early this morning praying over this message and thinking of this message, I was reminded of a song that our choir sang some years ago. And as I thought about this song, I, I, I thought about this, this person of Epaphroditus and what it means to be sacrificial. The one that says, listen, the life that I have, it's not my own anymore. It belongs to Christ. And so whatever I have to do, if I have to give up my own life in order that the work of Christ may be done, that's what I'm willing to do. I don't want you to listen to the words of this old song that our choir has sung. The words say this, this life is not my own. Oh, this life is not my own. I am His and His alone. This life is not my own. I was bought when love was slain. What I cost to pay death's wage. Now ransomed, I am freedom's slave. My Jesus raised me from the grave. Friend, here's the point of that entire song. The songwriter who wrote that song in Epaphroditus, and I hope you and I today understand that because Jesus paid our sin debt, the very least that we can do is say, you know what, this life is not about me. But Lord, I'm willing to sacrifice all that I have and all that I am in order that your will might be accomplished. Friend, listen, there's many ways that you and I can sacrifice for the Lord. Maybe it's a sacrifice of your time. In the fast-paced, busy world that we live in, time is becoming more and more precious. More and more things are pulling for our time and for our attention. And I'm not going to minimize it. I'll be honest with you. It is a sacrifice to give our time to the Lord, but it is a sacrifice much worth it.
Maybe it's the sacrifice of your effort, the sacrifice of shouldering responsibility, the sacrifice of money, the sacrifice of possessions. Whatever it is, rest assured that whatever the sacrifice is, it's always worth it. Friend, the goal of the Christian life is to become like Jesus. And if you're the one that says, well, he's perfect, I can never measure up. Paul said, let me give you a couple examples of Christians that are living the Christian life. Some examples worth examining. And as I prepare to bring this to a close, uh, I want to just give you a caution. There's an old adage that I want to just throw in here this morning. If we're not careful, we can become a victim uh, of what the old adage says is paralysis by analysis. Let me explain what that means just very quickly. The idea of paralysis by analysis means if we're not careful, we can say, you know what, I want to examine these examples. And I want to know every detail about Timothy. And I want to know every detail about Epaphroditus. I want to know all that it is, why Paul said uh, uh, to, to hold this man in high regard. And if we're not careful, we can look at this scripture and assume that it is for education only, just for analysis. Friend, make no mistake about it. God didn't record this in scripture just so that we can be educated. It's not just for education. It is also for application. And I want to encourage you this morning. Don't just look at the word of God and say, oh, well, now I know what the Christian life is supposed to be like. The idea, friend, is to apply the word of God. So how do you summarize all of that? Be sincere. Be selfless. Be seasoned. Be serving. Be sensitive. And be sacrificial. Some, as our p song leader and our pianist come, some this morning may say, Preacher, why would I do that? Simply put, because that's what Jesus wants from us. Because Jesus is the one that died for us. As the song that we are about to sing says, Because Jesus paid it all, and all to Him I owe. Friend, this morning, if you are saved, if you know the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior, I want to encourage you to live the Christian life. But friends, if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, if you've never had a time where you have been saved and where you trusted Christ, then I want to encourage you this morning, become a Christian. Be saved. I'm going to invite you to stand. I'm going to, sing, uh, I'm going to say a word of prayer.